<laughs> so 1.2 million arthropod parasite records from collections spread across North America is the goal. Uh, to publicly share all digitized records and associated information with data aggregators such as IDIG Bio, SCAN, and GBIP, and to capture at least 500,000 parasite host association records and make them accessible by partnering with Globi, the Global Biotic Interaction Database. In case you're not familiar with it, Globi is an open access data integration platform that continually indexes existing publicly available species interaction data sets, literature, and specimen records using open source software. You should definitely check them out if you haven't already. So far, we've made some tremendous progress with the project. We've transcribed and imaged over 800,000 specimens and records and shared these with data aggregators. Using ticks as just one example, you can see the records that used to be available on the SCAN database before the project started, which is a map on the left, the records that TPT and collaborators have added since the project started, which is the map in the middle, and the records that are now available for ticks combining all the data on SCAN, which is the map on the right. This is just an example using one taxon group, but it is representative of many of the other parasite groups that we've worked on. In addition to the specimen records and images with the TPT project, we've shared almost 800,000 association records with Globi and surpassed our original 500,000 goal. We've also been very active in citizen science projects and have launched more than 40 Notes from Nature expeditions that have resulted in almost 170,000 specimen transcriptions. Several of our Notes from Nature expeditions are currently in progress if you wanna go online and check them out. And we are actively adding more. There's even been a few more added since I made this presentation. <laughs> And even though we still have about a year left on the project, three of our TPT collections have already reached and or surpassed their original digitization goals. Congratulations. In addition to our basic digitization goals for the project, we've really tried to think beyond the TPT TCN and plan for sustainability. To this end, we've created, collaborated, and contributed to a number of free and open source community resources. And there will be QR codes and links again, just as a reminder. We created taxonomic tools and resources that can be found on our TPT Taxonomy Resource Hub. This includes taxonomic name lists for terrestrial parasite groups like fleas, ticks, mites, and lice. These lists have multiple formats available and can be used for a variety of purposes like database backbones or research. Each list has taxon specific contact information for the expert or experts that are associated with or contributed to the name list that we've produced. This information is all easily accessible and on the site with the name list. We've compiled, added, and created a number of useful R cleaning tools and scripts for creating the name lists that are on our site. And we have instructions on how to use everything on the site. They're both listed on the page itself and in downloadable README files. And since this is a GitHub-based web page, everything can easily be updated by TPT the greater community. It can be versioned when significant changes are made, and we have citable DUIs that can be applied as needed. We've been working closely with Globi to create an easy to navigate how-to instructions page. You can navigate to this page by clicking on the how-to tab from any part of Globi's website. The how-to page includes organized information and instructions on how to extract data from Globi, links to in-depth tutorials and Carpentry's workshops on how to use Globi, new command line scripts to facilitate downloads of custom lists or specific taxa for research or other purposes, 
and a community input suggestions document that is linked at the end of the page so that anyone who wants to contribute to can, even if you don't have any programming experience. This year, we also helped with the planning and organization of the Entomological Collections Management Workshop. This workshop was recently funded by NSF, and as you all know, provides important training for members of our community. By helping with the ECM workshop and turning the course this year into a hybrid version where attendees could participate in person or virtually, we had the opportunity to create a reusable lesson plan about interaction data. Our lesson plan, the Interaction Data Interpretation Workshop, is freely available online. It explores many potential issues that come up when trying to capture interaction data in databases or as part of a digitization protocol or other activity. The lesson plan was built using the Carpentries Workshop model, which has a GitHub backbone. This makes it easy to either use the lesson plan as is, contribute to improvements or updates, or there are detailed instructions available from the Carpentries on how to make a copy of the lesson plan and modify it for your own needs. The lesson plan also has a DUI and can be cited. As part of the TPT management process, we've created digitization progress reporting graphs. These progress graphs show not just the project start and end date, but the rate at which a collection is currently digitizing and the rate at which they need to be digitizing to meet their goals. These graphs can be made for overall digitization of a collection or group, or what we often like to do is to make a graph for each type of digitization that a collection is working on. One for wild specimens, one for slide mounted, one for images, transcriptions, et cetera. You only have to enter the data once and it will produce multiple graphs. The script and detailed instructions on how to use and modify it are all available and free on GitHub. We found these graphs to be super useful tools for collections and figuring out not just if they are on track with their digitization goals, but where and how they may need to tweak things to get back on track if need be. And I know I've mentioned GitHub a couple of times and many of you are probably familiar with that, but if not, you can just go there as a web page. You don't have to actually have any technological expertise. You can still just look at the web page, or you can contribute. The TPT group has actively been contributing to Bugflow. Bugflow is a community resource for developing and sharing entomological collection, digitization workflows, protocols, and modules. The idea is to increase community knowledge sharing so that collections don't reinvent a wheel that someone else may have already spent a ton of time developing. There are basic workflow outlines for pretty much every type of digitization entomological collections may run into, including everything from planning for a digitization project to proactive data capture in the field and pre-curation through imaging and data cleanup. The TPT group has contributed many exemplar workflows to this repository, as well as helped build many of the baseline workflow protocols. All resources are free to use or modify for your specific collection. We're also always looking for new example protocols, workflows, or folks to just generally help improve the repository. So if you're interested in contributing, please reach out to anyone in the Bugflow group, of which there are many of us here, we have contact information and instructions on different ways you can get involved on our website. And last but not least, we started working with the Biodiversity Outreach Network, BON for short. BON is a nonprofit organization that focuses on sharing and facilitating sharing of biodiversity data and related resources, particularly entomologically related data and resources. TPT has helped in the creation of several community-based resources, including an events calendar for biodiversity or entomologically related events and activities, a DIY project page for aggregating helpful instruction links and PDFs, and a sortable entomological suppliers page where, you've, where we've been aggregating information about where you can get different supplies, 
which may be especially useful now that BioEquip is no longer an option. There are links at the top or the bottom of all these pages so that everyone can contribute to the resources. With the idea that this page should be community driven, no technological expertise is needed. If you are one of the people who have already contributed to these community resources, thank you. We really appreciate it. And with that, I would like to thank all of the many, many people, collections, institutions, and partners that have helped make TPT and the free resources we've been working on possible. If there's time, I'm happy to take any questions, but otherwise my contact information and Jen's is at the bottom of the page there. Feel free to reach out to us about anything. Thank you. We have time for one question. And I'm also happy to send any of these links to you too. If you email me, I'll send you the whole list. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, next up um, again about uh, the uh, terrestrial parasite tracker project is Anthony Dashinsky. Good. Good morning. So I'm going to be talking about what we're doing at Clemson in terms of our digitization uh, with special emphasis on what we've been doing as part of the terrestrial parasite tracker project, which you've already heard about. So I won't go too in depth into the specifics of that. So the Clemson University Arthropod Collection, we're located in Clemson, South Carolina, which is located at the foothills of the uh, Southern Appalachian Mountains. So we have over 1.2 million pin specimens, estimated over 125,000 uh, alcohol vials. Uh, most of our specimens are from South Carolina or neighboring states, but we do have global holdings. Uh, one notable uh, uh, acquisition recently is that Jan Siegler, who did a bunch of publications on the beetles of South Carolina, gave us her collection, which again has strong emphasis on South Carolina beetle fauna, but uh, also has holdings from worldwide from her travels. Uh, so if you people have want to come and identify some of our beetles and other insects, we have a lot that needs to be done. So some photos. So we uh, we renovated the museum as part of an uh, NSF collection improvement grant back in 2015. Uh, as part of that, the, the university gave us an entire hallway to expand into and get new cabinets. We have our whole hallway that Mike Farrow is now decked out with all kinds of displays. So here's some of our collection. We have the nice Delta cabinets to keep our pin specimens pest free. And we have the, uh, the now fire marshal approved storage for all of our alcohol specimens so that we don't get in trouble anymore. Here's just some more of the pin holding showing it's how we use Cornell standards. Um, and so we've been working to digitize our collection. So we have over 33,000 records currently in scan. About 99% of those we managed to georeference. About 59% are new species, and there's the other breakdown, 185 families, 1,000 genera, uh, and a, a total of uh, 1,800 total taxa. And so we use pretty standard barcodes on both the pin specimens and the alcohol uh, material. Uh, we also, we try to database everything as it's being processed and mounted to load it in batches, even if it doesn't have determinations yet, so prevents having extra um, backlog being built up. So the Terrestrial Parasite Project is, as, as was gone over, part of the NSF-funded um, ADDC program. So we've been trying to capture our ectoparasites from our collection since we're, we are the South Carolina collection. We can fill in a lot of those gaps that might not be present in other institutions. So for our data capture, um, uploading into scan, we've done so far uh, 6, 000, over 6,000 records just from the Clemson collection. Uh, most of that has been pin specimens, about uh, 5,800 pin specimens, and so far about 300 vials, um, which are, reckon, uh, are over almost 2,000 specimens in vials. Uh, so the pins we've mostly completed. Uh, there's a few things, the hippoboscids and a few odds and ends haven't been uh, captured yet. In the alcohol material, the mosquitoes have been captured, but we still have a bunch of other uh, families that we need to get to. 
So uh, another contribution we made to the uh, terrestrial parasite tracker project is uh, Dr. Peter, Peter Adler, who's a world black fly expert based at Clemson, provided the taxonomic back, backbone that's being used for uh, what the current valid species of black flies are. So this is a living document he's been maintaining for years as publications come out and taxonomy changes. So our other contribution is that I've been working on database in Peter Adler's World Black Fly Collection. So this is the collection he's built up over the course of his career. He started it when he was in Pennsylvania in 1979. Uh, over the past 40 or so years, he's been getting a lot of holdings locally from South Carolina, but he's also done global travel. There's other specimens from all over. Um, I've noticed especially a lot from the Paleoarctic. Uh, he also has specimens that come from former students that have worked under him, specimens that he's uh, been requesting from colleagues that he's worked with on different projects. Uh, when he gets ID requests for specimens, those all go into the collection. And he's also had some donations of collections, including a small pinned collection from Australia, and I saw some from China, too, that were donated to him. Um, so there's some, so some specimens older than 1979, too, that were donated to him. Uh, there's some paratypes in the collection. Um, all of the primary types and some of the secondary types have already been deposited in USNM or CNC. So his personal collection isn't going to stay at Clemson. It's eventually going to go to the USNM. So we've been getting barcodes from them and databasing them uh, under their standards so they can incorporate them. Uh, when I talked to him, he said this, his collection should be one of the four largest black fly collections in the world. He said he also has the largest collection of simulated literature, but we haven't been doing anything with that currently. So his collection right now is housed in the Cherry Farm Insectary, which is off of main campus. There's no public transport there to there. You have to drive down. So that was a challenge with getting undergrads who would be willing to go and database it. So that's how I was brought in because I'm willing to go down there and hang out with him. So I've been working in this fairly old building, uh, working through his collection. So he has the two of these half cabinets of Cornell draws um, that are representing his pink collection. And you can kind of see it, maybe a few blue labels in there for some paratypes he still has. So I've worked through his pin stuff here in those four, uh, two cabinets. Then he has, most of his specimens are in the alcohol collection. So he has these four half bioquip cabinets of alcohol specimens. Um, and there's varying numbers of specimens, uh, adults, larvae, pupae, sometimes all intermingled, sometimes huge specimens, uh, huge lots of specimens, sometimes just one. Uh, many of them are also been uh, dissected uh, because he uses a karyotyping to put a species on a lot of these uh, flies. So a lot of uh, larvae torn in half. And that, when I do the specimen counts, I have to take that into account. What looks like two specimens is actually just one. So where we're at so far is all of his pin specimens I've gotten through and they're all database, which is over 3000 specimens. Uh, all of his slides, there were eight slides that were mixed in the pin material just in unit trays. Those all got captured. And then for the alcohol collection, I've done so far 2000 vials um, with an estimated 78,000 specimens. Uh, so I'm on the second of those four cabinets. So there's still two un whole untouched cabinets plus some of the, th the third one. And so I was going through, since he's been accumulating things from all over the world, uh, there's been different interesting things. He had some specimens from the Crozet Islands that there's a genus of uh, black fly endemic to there. And so that's some small islands off the coast of Antarctica. And the one that caught my eye was he had some specimens from Crimea collected in 2015. I can't imagine there's a whole lot of insects that have been collected there during that time frame. So some other database and projects we've we'll been doing in the Clemson collection. We did, we participated with LEPNET to uh, capture a lot of our moths um, to try to fill in some South Carolina gaps, including a Congaree National Park Moth Survey by Joe Kewen. And we had a former undergraduate, Nathan Arry, did a lot of this work, who then went on to do his master's at LSU. We did a Notes from Nature project on the aquatic insects from the Southeastern United States. Uh, so we did uh, over or almost uh, 1,500 alcohol specimens digitized. We used uh, photograph uh, worker, undergraduate workers to photograph the specimens and the labels and did standard notes for nature project. So Mike Farrow especially has also been working on some bycatch digitization to try to make our bycatch usable to researchers instead of just sitting forgotten about in the cabinet. So he lays out the sample, takes a photograph, including the data and our barcode. 
uh, and then uploads that online. And so I gave some links there that if you follow those links, you could see our photos of bycatch and you can go through, see, oh, uh, that's a really cool thing. I want that. Just send Mike a photo with the red circle over what you want and he can hopefully find time to get it to you. Uh, if you go to our we uh, museum website, you can also find these links there. So please request our specimens. We want them used. We want names on stuff. So uh, uh, Dr. Caterina has been the PI too, doing a lot of research right now in high Appalachian leaf litter insects. So he's been doing a meta barcoding project that he'll give a talk about uh, at ESA later. Um, he's had students working on other genera like Anilinus, Trechus, and Lathrobium. So he's been going to a lot of these high elevations and taking these samples of, uh, of early samples. And because he's doing these big samples and then all of this DNA work, we're generating a whole lot of different sample types that he has to work with. So we have the raw Berlazi samples, which then we're taking all of that bycatch and that's being saved and uh, sorted into unsorted bulk and given uh, uh, sample numbers. The rest are that we pull out or sort into the major taxa and then sort into morpho species. Some of them where we have a whole lot of them go into the, the unextracted extras, extras bycatch. Um, some of them will get pinned as vouchers. Uh, some of these specimens, uh, before they are extracted for DNA, they'll be photographed. Then the specimens are extracted. And uh, whenever we still have a viable specimen left after DNA has been extracted, those are being retained as vouchers and either mounted or preserved in alcohol. And so these are all cross-referenced cross, cross digitally based on morpho species, based on collecting events and individuals with DNA sequences. So it's been a lot of data to keep in line. So our play is again, as I said, if you guys can come visit, we have we have room for visiting researchers to work in our collection to identify some of our material, or we could send you loans. Uh, we also were willing to take donations of anything you guys want to give us. So if you're interested, contact Mike, um, and he'll work out the details with you. So we like to thank, especially NSF and Jen Zaspel for bringing us into the. Uh, a terrestrial parasite tracker project and if there's time i'll take questions okay questions nope okay oh, we got one uh let's see uh, would you want to answer that one <laughs> uh, a member of allegedly the same morpho species is not extract. <laughs> oh yeah. So he said it's a uh, specimen of allegedly the same morpho species that we didn't extract DNA from. Right. Um, next up is uh, uh, Zoe Albion and Colin Bailey, and they're going to talk about the Field Museum's Terrestrial Parasite Tracker program. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Colin Bailey. And my name is Zoe Albion. Um, and we are also on the TPT project. Uh, however, today we'd like to take some time to really highlight um, how we've worked with our volunteers to accomplish our goals. So as you heard from the last two speakers, the Terrestrial Parasite Tracker Project is an NSF funded grant. It includes over 30 institutions and it is going to produce quite a bit of data. And here at the Field Museum, we have quite a bit of ectoparasite data in particular um, to be extracted. We have a really significant uh, Loomis mite collection and the Lewis flea collection as well. And we're hoping to contribute 198,000 records digitized by the end of this project. This is a tremendous amount of data and it is not easily accomplished by staff alone. Uh, luckily for us, uh, we've got some added people power uh, through volunteers. Um, since Zoe and I have started, uh, we've recruited seven volunteers um, and they're coming at least one time a week. Um, they come from a variety of different backgrounds. Um, some of them are high school students. Uh, we have others that are retirees, uh, formerly doctors, engineers, artists, musicians, uh, and so on. And each which kind of provide a, a different perspective towards entomology as a whole. Um, our volunteers primarily work on the pre-curation portion of our uh, slide digitization process. 
Um, and this involves taking slides um, out of their boxes, organizing them based on certain criteria, uh, cleaning them off with some ethanol and a chem wipe, uh, and then finally, um, digit or sorry, uh, cataloging these slides into a um, online spreadsheet. Uh, so why build a volunteer program? There are many ways to approach a large grant like this, um, but we want to tell you today. Thank you. Um, so why, why build a volunteer program? Um, we want to tell you today about why we chose this approach. Um, first of all, volunteers are incredibly valuable, and there's many ways to assess that value. Um, just one of them uh, comes from an estimate from the independent sector who suggests, who suggests that volunteer hours are worth uh, 29, or excuse me, 29 American dollars and 95 cents an hour, um, which is pretty tremendous. And so that would mean that in one year, our team has given us over $40,000 of value. And the collection center volunteers at the Field Museum, that's just the back end, um, have contributed over half a million dollars of value, which is absolutely tremendous. Um, however, don't, uh, don't assume that that means that we think that they're their financial value is the only important thing that we're talking about here. Um, volunteers bring so much more to the table. Um, they come from diverse backgrounds. They have a variety of experience. Um, some of them have certifications um, and they're all stewards of natural history, really critical. Um, and we think that the volunteers add value, not just to our project, but to the museum and the program in general. Um, and we're also hoping to give them some value back. We're hoping to give them key skills and opportunities for personal growth. When we first started recruiting volunteers, uh, Zoe and I tried to draft up um, four initial goals which we wanted to meet. Um, and the first one was uh, pretty simple. We just wanted to build a strong relationship with these volunteers. Then using that relationship, we wanted to work cohesively uh, to fulfill the goals of the TPT grant. And through this, we hope that the volunteers come away with new skills, as well as an appreciation for uh, entomology, parasitology, uh, and natural history as a whole. Uh, and we started with clear and consistent communication. From day one, uh, we tried to specify what our expectations were for the volunteers. And also we tried to specify what their expectations for us should be. Um, and we treat that as an evolving concept. So we adjust the, um, adjust the expectations based on the knowledge that they have, the skills that they have learned. Um, and all of this happens as we get to know them. Um, and that happens through sharing a workspace. Um, in part, uh, we share a workspace with the volunteers, which we think is quite valuable. Um, not only do they get to ask us questions throughout the day and make sure that the quality of the data they're creating is high, but we're able to socialize with them and uh, really enjoy their company. Um, We've also um, uh, participated in some regular check-ins, which gives them the opportunity to share feedback with us and for us to share feedback with them. Um, finally, we try to consistently report their progress so they understand the impact they're actually making. Obviously, there's a lot of data involved here. It may seem like you're really not getting anywhere um, when those boxes are piled up, but we try to report their progress by giving them um, a monthly report in the form of an email, all the statistics from the past month, um, and also in smaller ways, like writing the number of boxes we've completed on the board so they can see from day to day how we progress. Um, and additionally, uh, we're trying really hard to fit the program to the volunteer. Um, and this also starts with indiv individualizing the training process. People learn in different ways, um, and we try to have a variety of instructional methods and also a variety of materials and resources. Uh, these materials and resources come in a variety of forms, um, including some documents that we created in-house, such as our slide digitization guide. Um, when we initially kind of drafted this up, uh, we had intended it for staff, uh, so it was, it was a little bit lengthy, um, had a lot of details to kind of incorporate all the small things that we may encounter. Um, and when, you know, we provided these to the volunteers, we found that it was uh, somewhat off-putting and kind of dense in terms of the material. Um, and because of that, it was sort of neglected and there was inconsistencies in the uh, sort of organizational work of the volunteers. Um, we instead drafted up a second version that was one page long, um, very simple to the point of what they needed to know. Um, and since then, uh, we believe that we've really kind of gotten everyone on the same page in terms of our, our methodology. 
Uh, we also provide some materials from um, outside of our museum, um, such as a variety of different peer-reviewed articles. Um, we have a, a checklist of all of the common species that we encounter, as well as any synonym that they may have, um, a list of certain common things, uh, like abbreviations and collectors that we find on our slides, um, and just sort of anything that will sort of assist them in, in sort of the process itself. But we also try to provide material that encourages them to, to kind of be curious about what they're doing and uh, get a little more understanding of like why this is important. Um, and so one of the ways we do that is simply when we come across an article that we find interesting, whether it be about a, a collector or the specimen itself, uh, we try to share that with them and try to tie it into uh, uh, the work that they are doing. Um, we also let the volunteers provide material for themselves. Uh, so we've started a what we call the TPT library. So anytime that they come across an article or a book that sort of refers to entomology, they can bring it in and share it amongst their peers. Another way that we're trying to encourage personal learning is to, to get them to think about the data that's in their hands. Um, when they're cleaning off these slides, it's you know admittedly not the most glamorous of work. Um, I, a lot of volunteer tends not to be. Um, but that doesn't mean it's not important and that they should understand why they're doing this. Um, so we're trying to do small things to get them to think about that. Um, one of the ways we've done that is through a, a contest we've created called Host of the Month, in which we encourage the volunteers to actually um, do sort of a, an in-depth look at some of the um, hosts that they come across on their slides. Um, and then they can tell us about these hosts. And at the end of the month, uh, a couple of staff members subjectively vote on a winner. Um, and I think this has really kind of uh, gotten people excited. And, you know, instead of just seeing a taxonomy that they don't understand, they're, they're getting a little context, understanding the ecological importance of this. Um, and above all, we want to create a culture of respect and community, um, not just between us and the volunteers, but also for their peers. Um, we try to foster peer relationships as much as possible. The volunteers come in one to two days a week, as I mentioned. Um, they work with between one and three other volunteers during that time. Um, and so in addition to trying to encourage those friendships, we try to encourage socialization across those daily schedules. Um, so uh, we encourage the sharing of notes. Uh, for example, there is one very intense limerick competition happening <laughs> between two of the volunteers. Um, we also encourage, as you can see here, for them to personalize their workspaces. Um, someone has decided that The Rock is their real supervisor. <laughs> Um, I think he's doing a great job. <laughs> um, and in addition to that sort of fun, um, we also try to consistently give them opportunities to celebrate their achievements and, and recognizing those achievements as well. Um, that can be as simple and silly as a, a crown for a participant who uh, finished four boxes before noon, which was a big success. Um, and also we have all sorts of after hours socialization opportunities. Um, when we hit 500 boxes, we had a big party. Recently, we had a screening of The Relic, which was filmed at the Field Museum for uh, Halloween. Um, and we try to celebrate small stuff too, like birthdays and graduations. Um, looking back at our initial goals, um, I, I believe we've uh, met them current, at our sort of current state. Um, so we first wanted to build a relationship um, and, it, you know, it's somewhat subjective. What is a relationship? Um, but we recently sent out a survey to the volunteers uh, where they can anonymously give some feedback about their motivations for continuing to uh, volunteer. And every respondent, um, their number one response was a sense of community and socialization. Uh, they really enjoy coming in, sort of making friends, and it you know, gives them something to do, something to talk about. Um, most of them also stated um, a sense of um, Trust. trust and um, kind of, yeah, trust in their supervisors and confidence. Um, next, we wanted to fulfill the goals of the TPT grant. Uh, and that's something we are still currently in the process of, um, but the volunteers have helped us out significantly. Um, between the seven of them, they dedicated 1,357 hours of their lives to digitizing these parasites. Um, and this has resulted in over 30,000 slides being pre-curated, which saves Zoe and I plenty of time. Um, we also wanted to give volunteers the opportunity to learn new skills, which is something that I think most volunteers have done. Um, we even had a, a former volunteer 
who worked with us starting with slides. Um, he asked for a little more responsibility, so we trained him on KEEMU and databasing, um, and is now actually employed in a, another department at the museum. On um, the same survey that I mentioned earlier, uh, many participants also referenced that they just enjoy being a part of this historic collection, and it gives them sort of a sense of belonging um, and contribution to the field of science. Um, and finally, an appreciation of arthropods and parasites. Um, believe it or not, most people are not excited about fleas and ticks. Uh, they find them repulsing. Um, so I think we're, we're both just very proud that our volunteers come in each day and they, they're excited to actually engage with these parasites. Um, so as Erica mentioned, uh, we are in our last year of the grant, which does not mean that all of the work goes away. Um, if it's not finished, it just means that uh, myself and Colin will no longer be there to support the volunteers. So we want to put a few things in place to make sure that more volunteer work can happen. Um, we are being careful about our documentation, providing that the standards can stay consistent. Um, we're diversifying those responsibilities amongst volunteers, especially the ones that now have a lot more experience. Um, and we're trying to grow the peer support of the program so that when Colin and I are sadly not next to them in the cubicles, they can still support each other. Um, and we have a lot of people to thank, in particular, uh, the TPT team, Jen and Erica, our field museum team, Maureen and Becca, and our fabulous volunteers. They are the fleas knees, and we think they're the best part of our day. Thank you. We have time for questions. Yes. Great talk. I think so hard to engage volunteers. Well done. How do you go about approaching the volunteers? You've got a great group now, but how did you end up building this group? We've, uh, we've come across. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so the question was uh, how we recruit our volunteers. Um, and we certainly at the Field Museum have a big advantage because we already have a really robust Field Museum volunteer community. And actually um, at the beginning of this project, uh, we were required to recruit internally because of COVID-19 uh, restrictions. Um, but since that time, we have done a bunch of outreach. Um, we were on, what was it? Uh, NBC News. Yeah. Some, somebody came to talk to us, apparently, um, from the news, which is very exciting. Um, and we try to be present at um, local events like uh, science nights and, and things like that. Did you mention uh, briefly a survey that you used to maybe evaluate the program a little bit? Um, I'm interested in that, and I wonder if that's something that you would reuse from other projects and you could help to subtract maybe some, uh, some examples that you um, that's something that um, we had just made on our own. Um, we just simply wanted to get a little insight from them. Um, you know, we we hear from them that they're content and that they're happy, uh, but we just wanted to kind of give them an opportunity to anonymously give some feedback. Um, so that's something that we made. Um, and it was just, it was a lot of questions that kind of were in our check-ins just about kind of, are they content? Um, what could we be doing to improve our work? Um, yes. Yeah, I think we get some surprising feedback and yeah. Um, motivations for volunteering was a big one. Thank you. Um, we're done with the terrestrial parasite tracker program now. <laughs> Uh, next, we have Erin Powell from the Florida State Collection of Arts, and she's going to talk about the scale and white fly collection there. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Erin Powell. Um, I, I am the curator of the Coxoidea and Allerodidae at the Florida State Collection of Arthropods. My co-author today is uh, Dr. Z Ahmed, who is now the USDA, but he's my predecessor and was previously the curator of this collection. Mm -hmm. 
So just a brief history of the FSCA it began as the state plant board and originally the FSCA was built to protect Florida's agriculture. And at first we didn't really have a lot of specimens being added to the collection, but in the 1960s there was a big merger of many collections in Florida that resulted in us growing rapidly and, and today we have between nine and 10 million specimens and you guys are going to hear more about uh, our collection in the collection tours later on so I won't dwell too much on this. So uh, we have a lot of specimens coming in via import inspections, surveys of nurseries, surveys of natural areas, trappings. So we're always adding to the collection in that way, in addition to donations from various researchers. So the Coxoidea and Allerodidae, if you're not familiar with these groups, the Coxoidea, it's about 34 extant families of scale insects, mealybugs, various scales, soft scales, armored scales, pit scales. Um, and the Allerodidae are the white flies. And these guys are major plant pests and a big part of uh, why the FSCA and the Florida State uh, Plant Board was actually started. Um, so our first state entomologist, Dr. Berger, in 1915, he had three major projects that he was working on and two of those were working on this group. So one, he was working on rearing beetles to control cotton cushion scale. He was also working on rearing fungus to control white flies. And then he also had a project on thrips. So this group has always been major plant pests for Florida and always been a big part of our organization. So the hemiptera comprise most um, of the, well, a majority of the, the samples that we receive at DPI. Um, the other hemiptera really take it away in part uh, because of Dr. Susan Halbert, who curates the rest of the hemiptera, her enormous trapping efforts across the state. She has all these novel trapping methods, suction traps, that she's collecting aphids and psyllids and, and monitoring the other hemiptera. Um, and then second to that is the Coxoidea and Allerodidae. These are mostly coming from um, inspection surveys, nursery surveys. So we've had several curators over the course of the FSCA's history that were working on the Coxoidea and Allerodidae, a lot of turnover, but also you can see how important they were just because in the early days, we actually had some overlap with multiple curators working um, on the Coxoidea and Allerodidae. Um, and then the past decade or so, we've had quite a bit of turnover, losing some people um, to, to administration and the USDA. Um, and it's really tough for them to fill this scale job because not many people are actually uh, trained in scale insects, which is how I fell into this. Um, so we all have a lot of uh, uh, great scale and, and whitefly taxonomists that have contributed uh, paratypes and uh, whole types and donations to our collection. Many of those uh, originated at the USDA. Um, and about 20% of our scale paratypes come from Doug Miller, who is a uh, retired USDA um, researcher that is now a uh, research associate at the FSCA, who has mentored me enormously. So the other hemiptera has had a lot more continuity in their curators over the years. So between 1953 and now, they've had two curators that have been there for, for quite a long time. And Dr. Susan Halbert actually had to take over the scales as well. Uh, between me and, and Z. So that was a, an enormous undertaking for her to handle all of the hemiptera that were coming in. So the coxoidea are interesting because adult females exhibit neoteny. Basically, they look like immatures, even though they are sexually mature females. And the adult males are also odd. Uh, they actually just have a single pair of wings, much like the flies. And very few males are described. So we're actually mostly relying on adult females for identification. So Florida has a lot of scale insects. Um, it, we're only second to California as far as the, the species diversity in the United States. Uh, we have about 35% of the total US species. So we have uh, about 387 species in Florida compared to all of Canada that only has 115 species of scale insects known. Um, and this is, you know, of course, partially a, a sampling bias because of various scale workers working in different parts of the country. Um, but it also just goes to show that, that scales really like uh, subtropical, tropical climates and are more diverse in those areas. Um, so because of this, scales are a major regulatory issue because they have a, a good propensity to uh, establish and become invasive in Florida um, and damage and our, our uh, agriculture. So the Allerodidae are the white flies, and for some reason, these guys have historically been grouped. I think that just the early curators had you know, expertise in, in these two areas, so they've split these away from the other hemiptera, and the curators have always done you know, white flies and scales, and then the other hemiptera. Um, so the uh, adults of white flies are, are a little bit more like normal insects. You have both uh, sexes with four wings. 
Um, and we actually use the pupa, which um, <laughs> is annoying because these guys are hemipterans, um, but it's the, the fourth in star uh, or the pupa is what is used for identification of uh, white flies. So we also have a big diversity of white fly species in Florida. We actually have more than California, probably the most in the country, that, but the statistics are not as clear on these. Um, so 77 species in Florida and only about 12 in Canada. So I'm not sure if we need to look for more white flies here or if we're just lucked out and, and, and don't have them too cold. So scale insects seem like they probably don't disperse very well because you know the adult females, they don't have wings. They don't really move around. Um, armored scale females don't even have legs. Once they settle, they're, they're done and they're not moving ever again. Um, but somehow they seem to be able to establish and become invasive all over uh, the world um, and come from all over the world to Florida and other places. So one way that they're moving around is via the wind, just because they're tiny and get picked up. Um, but there's also a phoretic um, component. So the image below is SEM images of first instar crawler armored scales. And they actually have these tarsal fidget tools that have almost like little suction cups at the end. And they're using those to grab onto any other better flying insect that can move them around more efficiently. Um, and of course, at all stages, humans are moving scale insects and whiteflies around the world. They're small, they're inconspicuous, uh, they're easily you know, missed on um, import inspections, so they are a big problem coming um, around the world. So they cause a lot of plant damage, they vector diseases, they make a, a huge mess of wax and sooty mold that impedes photosynthesis. Um, so just, just a major plant pest. Um, as I mentioned, they're very easily transported. Uh, they have a rapid generation time. Many species are parthenogenic, so they actually just need one single female to arrive and start a new population. Uh, scale insects and whiteflies are notorious for being resistant to pesticides. Um, partially because they're covered in wax and, and there's just this physical barrier. Um, once they're introduced to a novel habitat, it usually takes a while for natural enemies to actually recognize them and start um, taking care of them. But we'll often see a big explosion in populations of scale insects and whiteflies that have arrived in Florida. And then they kind of get checked back as the natural enemies find them and start to take care of them. Um, but that's not always the case. Uh, some things like our psychic scale in Florida just has continuously been a major problem, even though there's tons of parasitoids going after it. So since 1980, we have about 75 invasive species of scales and whiteflies that have arrived in Florida and become established. Uh, the Coxoidia and Allerotidia are slide mounted and they're particularly tricky because they are covered in wax and can be difficult to clean um, and, and get you know, good enough slide mounts to be able to see all the characters that we need to see. So our slide collection had a big revamp in 2021. We uh, got rid of our shelving and got new compactors, which essentially doubled our space. We have plenty of room for expansion now, which is exciting. So our scale insect collection, um, as well as the white flies, are, is one of the top Coxoidia and Allerotidia collections in the United States and in the world. Um, as far as the Coxoidia goes, the USNM has uh, the, you know, the most species and slides in total. This is 2019 data. Um, the, the CDFA, the California State Collection, has more species but less slides. And UC Davis, um, not completely clear on their statistics of total number of species, but they do probably have more type holdings because the Ferris collection was donated to, the, to UC Davis. So we have a good amount of species representation in our collection. It's very Florida heavy, but we do have um, you know, a lot of material from the entire United States and from um, South America and Asia. We have 25 of the 34 extant Coxoidia families represented, um, over 85,000 slides and counting. Our collection is over 99% curated. We have a great team of technicians that have worked tirelessly to get everything sorted and, and labeled. Um, when Z started, he had quite a backlog. Um, he had about 70% of the collection curated. Um, he got it up to about 97. And today we you know, have maybe like a month's backlog of stuff that's still wet and needs to be labeled. But generally we're, we're really on top of things thanks to our staff. Um, in addition to slides, we have dried uh, pinned material um, of scale insects that are still on the plant material, which is a nice thing to have. They're not really identifiable anymore, but it's always nice to, to you know, see what they looked like on the plants before they were slide mounted. And it also gives us information about the, the wax covers that they had in life. 
Um, and we also have an alcohol collection that I'm working on continuously growing um, for molecular purposes. So we have um, about 700 paratypes of proxoidea and allorotidae, um, not a ton of primary types. And this is because historically primary types have been given to the USM. Um, but we're trying to you know, encourage um, more primary types to stay at FSCA. Here's just a cool example of one of our holotypes. And then um, this is an armored scale and you can see what she looks like on the slide, that little speck on the slide. So there's plenty of projects sitting in wait. Um, I'm working on grass infesting mealybugs. We had some collected at a nursery, realized that it was an, an undescribed species, go into the collection. Turns out it was also found in the 80s um, and has just never been described. So we have a nice series of you know, some new hosts and new localities for that species. Um, adult males are rarely mounted, but now we have additional um, slide mounts of adult males for that species to describe. Um, and just lots, lots of slides sitting in there that people recognize as new species or new genera that just need to, to be worked on, just not enough time. So um, just a, a good point about how important identifications are for research and how it's easy to misidentify scales. Um, this is a regulatory issue because for a long time we thought that Kyanastas pinpoli was in Florida. Um, but Z and uh, Z Ahmed and Doug Miller went back and re-examined the slides in our collection and realized it actually was not in Florida. And this is a regulatory issue because this is actually coming in on Christmas trees into Florida from um, uh, the northern states. Um, so it actually does need to be, uh, you know, a regulatory species. But for a while we thought that it was in Florida, but it actually turns out it's not. There's actually some published work where they were using the wrong species for the research just because the, the, they were improperly identified. So I just like to acknowledge um, my current staff, Doug Miller, our research associate, past technicians that have worked on um, curating the collection and getting it um, so well curated today, um, as well as our funding sources. Feel free to send me specimens. Scales are, are um, not very co not collected very often. I know that a lot of our collections in the country don't have a big a representation of scale insects, but I'm happy to identify them, happy to take fresh material um, if you'd like an ID. Um, I always would like to add more material to the collection from out of state and out of country because um, it is pretty Florida heavy. So, thank you. Uh, we have time for one or two questions. Your samples still under how, how do we store the scales still on their host leaf? So we just put them in a drying oven um, and then there's a lot of material that goes in envelopes um, and then we have some just kind of like for some display drawers that the, the material actually gets pinned like we have some twigs that will just brace with pins uh, but it takes up a lot of space so most of the stuff is in envelopes. Yeah. Uh, this from your yes. How many minutes uh, spent into preparing one slide? from clearing the scale. Uh -huh. I mean, the, the hands up of the weighting and the solvents, but to prepare one slide, all the manual steps, uh, how many minutes are the two minutes? Yeah, so it is very tedious. Um, yeah, so they sit in, in uh, KOH for a while and they'll sit in clove oil for a while. But as far as like actually touching them, probably for a nice ball subside, at least 20 minutes per specimen of actually like manipulating them and touching them um, and, and then labeling and identifying. So they're, yeah, they're very, very time intensive. Yep, all done. All right, uh, next up, uh, Ms. Carl Schnepp from the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, and he's going to talk about trichodesma and a study in the importance of insects for insect collection. All right, everybody, uh, can everybody hear me? Uh, so I'm going to talk about trichodesma, um, a study that started with working on some West Indian stuff. And in doing so, decided to, you know, get a broader view of the genus, borrowed stuff for the U.S., looked, started looking at that, and realized that uh, there's a lot of new stuff in the West Indies, but there's also a lot of new stuff in the U.S., which is a place that, you know, theoretically is, is well collected and well understood. Um, but as you can see with collections, uh, you, can, you can show that that's not the case. 
And uh, I enjoy alpha taxonomy. So one of my favorite quotes, progress in natural history starts from a basis of species. And until these are accurately described so that others can arrive at a knowledge of them, no great advance is possible. And so that goes back to actually looking at specimens, having specimens, and maintaining collections. <laughs> uh, so again, briefly talk about history of the genus, uh, current knowledge, what I've kind of compiled, because there's no uh, synthesis of the genus, really. The U.S. fauna specifically, because that's what I've uh, dived most deeply into, overall diversity, and hopefully what I can do in the future. And then again, just in words of collections. <clears throat> So it's probably true for a lot of our groups. There's no comprehensive treatment. There's a bunch of species descriptions out there. There's uh, um, very few figures. Basically, the figures here are the only figures that exist pre-1980. Um, and so for diversity that's out there, uh, it's not much to go off of. Uh, the genus itself is poorly defined. Um, looking at all the specimens that I've gotten on loans, it looks like there's probably there could be multiple genera, but that's you know a, a deeper thing that I'll have to dive into after getting this from alpha taxonomy. And the only treatments that treat more than one species or more than one species description is fall 1905, who did uh, some species from the U.S. in Baja, and, and it was just a few descriptions and a key. And Vinolas in 2018 for uh, the seven species in Africa. And that's a really good work. It's got a lot of good figures, um, and so that's that's basically it. Uh, for the world fauna. And then the ones at the bottom there, those eight are all publications that um, have some sort of figure. And outside of that, all the other species uh, ha have, have no real good diagnosis and the descriptions are usually fairly poor. Uh, so after diving pretty deep into this, found out that there are 72 valid extant species in the world, four fossil species uh, distributed in North and South America, Africa, India, and Southeast Asia. And for the U.S. and Canada, there's nine valid species. And one species needs to be synonymized. And I found that there are five new species. Um, and I've thrown together a world catalog for the, the genus. And it's got type localities and where the types posited and the distribution, uh, if it's known. And so for the U.S. and Canada, these are the, um, the, the, the named and new species. Um, a lot of them. And so for the ones that are known, um, I have looked at 117 collections, uh, borrowed a lot of stuff, probably from a lot of people in this room. Uh, and those are distributions for three of the common widespread species. And I've looked at 2000 specimens and, and have their records. And so all that data is available. And these are the new species for the US. Uh, the one on the left there is from South Florida and the Keys. Uh, maybe the same as one, a new one that's in Bahamas, but I'm not sure yet. Uh, next one over is from South Central California. Um, very few, I think I have three specimens of that one. So if you have any collections out there, I'd love to see them. Uh, and the next three are all in South Texas. And so some interesting things that popped up are, um, and, what, and why collections are so important, is that there can be records online. So out of these six images, they're they're paired together. They're the same species. The the one on the right on each of each pair is an iNaturalist record, and uh, they're you know the, the one on the bottom left is from South Texas, and uh, there's one known pen specimen that we have uh, collected by our own Patrick Goring, um, and that's the only specimen that we have. Obviously, I want more to describe it, but there are actually iNaturalist records, but they didn't collect them, and so not having specimens again uh, makes it a problem. The two on the right are, uh, the one on the top is a named species, it's Pulchella, and the one on the bottom is a new species that's been lumped in with that species, um, and, and just by seeing the images, people put these things together, but having specimens in hand, we can tell the differences, and so the bottom two there are named. And so that's a lot of the U.S. fauna, um, but here is some of the world fauna. Uh, it gets very diverse. The top row there is mostly from Africa. Um, there seem to be some clades, but again, that's a, a, a deeper dive. Uh, the top row on the right there are some from the West Indies, and the, the bulk of the rest of them are from Central America. There are a few from Southeast Asia, um, a few from South America, um, but it's just, there's a lot of diversity. So again, as I said, 72 described species, um, and there's probably at least 100 described, and all that's you know, 
from from collections that that, that data you know you, you can't get that data from anywhere else other than actually getting looking at the specimens um all the ones up here right now are from central america and you can see here central america has 19 named species and there's probably at least 30 new um almost all of these i think three of these might be named and the rest are basically new um but it goes back to i also have to see the types and, and do other things which I, i've done some of there um but for the West Indies, there's five names. That's where I started with this because it looked like they were new. There are several new, um, but there's not as much material as there is for the US. So that's why I'm starting with the US for the revision. Um, Central America, like I said, 19 names, 30 new. South America is kind of a mess because um, Pete got a hold of it and I have to go to uh, Paris probably to figure any of that out. Um, Southeast Asia, 20 named, probably six new. And uh, FK name and probably at least five new. And this is just stuff that I've seen from US collections. This isn't really international. Um, but so the, the font is probably more than 100 undescribed, but that's just uh, for a cool group like this, it's kind of surprising. Um, and in case you were wondering if it was just the color patterns that might change and might shift and, and it's not actually valid, um, the genitalia are also fairly unique and distinct uh, between species. Um, again, there might also be some clades going on here. Um, and hopefully this can can help out. And in the future, uh, after doing the US revision, hopefully I can get into Central America at least. Um, if I get to Paris, maybe South America and, and other parts of the world and name some of these species. Also diving deeper and seeing if any of these things actually fall out into distinct species groups, species complexes. Uh, and then beyond that, seeing if some of those might actually be different genera. Um, because again, the genus itself is not well defined at all. Um, and along with that, someone like that it might be useful, but again, a lot of these specimens are from museums, so they at least exist, um, but there's not that much recently collected stuff. And a lot of places where these were collected from, deposited in, are uh, no longer exist. And so some of these habitats are probably destroyed. Um, and was, obviously it's stretched to say some of these might be extinct, but for depending on what their niche was and their habitat, um, some of them could be. And so again, that just shows the importance of collections. Um, and yeah, hopefully molecular data. Um, there's basically nothing out there now. So anything I generate would would be new. Um, that's a lot of species to try to include. Um, and then again, beyond that is tribal and subfamily relationships, which uh, are again, not well defined at all in, in the family. And in terms of species groups, uh, this was a, the, the one on the left there, it says named as a Hawkeye, it was described from Thailand. And uh, there are actually I think, nine species in the genus, but that's the only one I had a, a representative to take an image of. And the six on the right are some of the Central American clade. And the nanodesma itself was described very, very recently, I think it was three years ago, but it's not well defined, just like trichodesma. Uh, and so the ones in the, on the right there are all Central American clade. That are very similar in terms of the body plan, the body style, the very short, squat, rounded. Um, and so asking some more questions about what generic limits are, is that genus valid? Uh, are there more genera in trichodesma that need pulled out? Uh, and how widespread maybe nanodesma might actually be. And that I think uh, people are helping with imaging and um, probably a lot of people here for their loans. And if anyone else has specimens they want to send me, I'd love to see them. Uh, we have a lot of time for questions. Yes. Um, I just want to know if you have a well hypothesis at all. I don't know if that big drug you just spotted. No, I don't. Uh, so it's probably something to do, depending on what they're doing. A lot of them, the, the question is uh, the ones with the round spot, if there's a, you know, what, what I might know that that's for. Um, for. For the specimens collections, there's not much data out there other than a lot of them come to lights. And a lot of them are collected beating. And so if they're hanging out on, on branches, I don't know that most of that clade is Central America, like Mexico specifically and, and Baja. And so if there's some lichen or something that has a similar uh, look, they, they may be trying to mimic and hide. So, yeah. So I've got a question from the chat, Umberto. It's Costa Rica. Okay. What is the best methodology to collect from SD, which is not very long in our research? Uh, the question is, what is the best way to collect domesticity? This, well, these are tenants, um, very similar. Uh, but for Costa Rica, the ones I've seen from there come to lights, which I think is great. 
catch all way to collect. But uh, a lot of them from Central America that are very different that might not come to light that I've only seen a few specimens of, um, beading is basically the best way to get them. Um, there's no real other way to trap, maybe some flight intercepts. I've seen a few, but yeah. Yeah. What are the larvae doing? Are any of them being moved around with the product? So that's interesting. The one from South Texas that Patrick actually collected, when I saw that um, pop up, it was kind of interesting because a lot of collecting from down there I've seen of AM's collection, um, Ed Riley stuff, and it, they had never picked it up. And so I thought maybe that one had been moved from somewhere else. Um, but as far as I can tell, it's it's not a described species and it's not something that occurs anywhere else. Um, but theoretically, they're in wood. I think the gibbosa, the eastern species, some of the like the larvae are known for that one, and they are feeding in wood. Um, but basically, for all of the others, I don't think there's any life history beyond that. Yeah. We got about two or three minutes. Uh, so, if you want to refill your coffee or so before we drop the next talk, is Max Fonte here? <laughs> Then during the 15 minute break, just put on the sponsor yep. show. Yep. Oh, okay. All right, we're going to continue soon, so give it another minute to settle down. Yeah. We'll take that from your talk. No, don't hmm? worry. Okay. How much is information could that be? 10 minutes? All right, next up is Christopher Wirth from Purdue. And she's going to talk about beyond the label about the Willis S. Bletchley collection and his localities. 
Well, it's great to see everyone. For those who, who haven't met me, I'm Chris Wirth. I'm the collection manager at Purdue University. And today I'll be talking about, uh, well, another Blatchley rant. Um, this time of trying to refine some of Blatchley's localities. So in case you're unfamiliar, who was Blatchley? He was a naturalist teacher and the state geologist of Indiana, lived from um, 1859 to 1940, um, and said of himself that he didn't wish to be known as a specialist, but rather a, a bit of everything, as you can see from the, from the quote here, an ichtho bot, bata orna geo con, con, entum, et cetera, ologist in, in a small way so that he could see the interdependence of various classes of nature's objects. And so a very holistic approach, perhaps, which is a shame and that he's today and known only as an entomologist in, in many circles. But Blatchley as an entomologist was, was largely self-taught with the exception of one course as an undergraduate and some advice from one of his um, teachers who, who when asked what area of study had the greatest potential for original research, um, his teacher said entomology. And so at 25, Blatchley dedicated himself to, as he said, his future life's work that night. Um, he began collecting insects in, in the mid 18, 1880s and kept these in cigar boxes until he actually um, generated money by writing newspaper columns and, and eventually had a case and Schmidt boxes built but a state geologist, Blatchley traveled widely in Indiana, and then um, later, after his retirement as state geologist, then spent most winters in Florida and collected about his home and on several trips into southern Florida. And as a naturalist in, in the field, Blatchley attributes most of his success, you know, one, one of the key factors to his success was carrying into the field pocket notebooks and writing sometimes for 10 to 15 minutes at a time. And he said that in, in an autobiographical talk near the end of his life, he said, I still have more than 40 of these notebooks on hand. We'll get back to that. But as an entomologist, Blatchley was active um, as his sole occupation from, from his, the end of his time as state geologist in 1911 to 1930. And in in his entomological pursuits, um, Blatchley was aided by his secretary, Isadora Kessler, who has been largely overlooked. And that's a shame because Isadora wrote, um, not only took down all of Blatchley's correspondence from the time he was state geologist for the next 40 years, but typed all of the manuscripts for his books, um, and other publications, and wrote all of the labels, and I'm not certain whether these are the locality labels, the determination, the header identification labels, but from every aspect of Blatchley's entomological activities, I think um, Isidore Kessler was key, and, and I was thrilled to find this one photo of them at work. Now, Blatchley's collection, um, he amassed a significant personal collection. Um, I can't find exact numbers for the species, but in 1924, he quotes this at about 10,000 species. Um, and near the, at the, at the end of his entomological career, had amassed approximately 63,000 specimens. And that may seem small for that amount of time Blanchard was active, but this doesn't factor in extensive trade, um, sale of specimens, uh, both to um, museums and to other individuals. Uh, for example, um, Tanner recalls a, a single purchase of 300 weevil species from Blatchley that at a minimum was 1,200 specimens. And Blatchley would remove a good many specimens, imperfect, duplicate, mounted specimens, and give them to the Indiana State entomologist and to a local high school. So the collection, Blatchley's personal collection is, is really representative only of the material that he personally retained. There's much more Blatchley material out there. In 1930, Blatchley's eyesight had degraded to a point that he was compelled to give up entomology 
Um, he wished to keep his collection in the Middle West um, and sold it in 1936 to the Department of Entomology at Purdue University, then chaired by his um, friend, John June Davis. And then Blanchet had previously sold his unmounted duplicates to the British Museum. Um, and here, this is a picture of Blatchley in his study at Holman. And one of those cases with Blatchley Schmidt boxes is visible in the background. Now, I mentioned Blatchley's notebooks. And why is this particularly frustrating it is that Blatchley's labels are very brief. They give only the county, or in the case of his Florida specimens, only a city, then his initials and a date. However, on some of his specimens, there is a minute label just below the specimen above the locality labels that has a little accession number. And even in Blanchley's, um, one of Blanchley's books, he mentions each pin below the specimen should bear a, not only the locality label, but an accession number. And Blanchley even notes that it should correspond to field notes except that we don't know where Blatchley's notebooks, over 40 notebooks are today. They aren't at Purdue, whether it's in our, within the Department of Entomology or in the Purdue archives, they're not at Indiana University, Blatchley, Blatchley's alma mater. They're not at the Dunedin Historical Society. And they're not at a little, as of this year, a little 100 year old nature study club outside of Indianapolis that renamed itself after Blatchley during his lifetime. They do have some scrapbooks and, and some of the photos you're seeing, um, including the photo of Blatchley and Kessler, um, but they don't have Blatchley's notebooks. So spurred by this presence of accession numbers, I've started to compile the accession numbers um, and try to correlate those to the dates of the specimens. And how do we do this if we don't have Blatchley's notebooks? Well, Blatchley wrote copiously some 200 and about 250 publications totaling at least 11,000 pages. Uh, foremost amongst this, Blatchley wrote two autobiographical brochures, Blatchley Anna 1 and 2. And this gives a chronology of his life with yearly entries from about 1876 to the year before he, you know, the year he year before he died. However, this includes only his notable activities um, and travels, but it does mention collecting. So from this, we can start to narrow down where Blanchley was and where he was collecting, largely though for his, like I mentioned, his exceptional um, events. Um, and still with, um, a lack of specificity as to the localities. And unfortunately, the same with his state geologist reports. Um, these were often descriptive, um, often tailored to industry where there were certain materials present. And while they give some information on localities, it's, it's very geology focused, unsurprisingly. Um, and some of the data were generated by assistants. So we can't assume that the localities given in Blatchley's state geologist reports exactly correlate to his specimens, his county level specimens, because he had assistants working. With the one exception of a report on Indiana caves and their fauna. And that actually includes specific, almost a narrative account of a cave survey in the Southern part of Indiana and specific mentions of the taxa found and their habitats. So with that, I could start to compile some more specific information to supplement Blatchley's chronology. Second, Blatchley wrote scientific articles. However, these are largely biased um, towards his species description, with one exception, where in 18, in summer 1891, Blatchley collected for about two weeks in southern Mexico, and he gives a generalized account of entomologizing in Mexico with uh, an account of many of the species collected. However, many of those specimens are not present in the Purdue collection. Frustratingly, um, so in Blatchley's species descriptions, we start to finally get some more information where we can distill down 
where Blanche was collecting and a little bit more information. Not every one of these localities has great additional data, but I was able to find uh, 41 dates or collecting events for Indiana. But then for Florida, I found uh, 165 dates or collecting events in Blanchley species descriptions. And of course, these refer only to the type material Blanchley, dis um, Blanchley was collecting. But with some of those accession numbers and dates, I hope to uh, apply this more broadly to um, other specimens. And in Blanchley's manuals, the frustrating component is that all of the county and, and location, the final locality information is presented without the year. So to use any of the information in Blanchley's manuals, um, almost 4,000 pages of text, and Blanchley mentions putting um, in just his Heteroptera manual over 4,000 notes in there, just to use those, we need to check the, the specimens. And so that is a long-term process as we digitize more material. However, in two of Blatchley's manuals, he gives a map of Indiana collecting. In the Purdue Entomology Archives, I was able to locate a larger original copy of this map and georeference it. Now, most of the localities, um, most of the counties have two to three collecting events in them. However, about a third have a single locality to a county. So we can start to narrow down some of those county only localities. Then Blatchley's other publications, four of his, he wrote, um, he wrote nature books in addition. Four of them contain chronological um, sort of di diary style daily entries extracted from Blatchley's field notes. And particularly in days of gone, Blatchley, Blatchley intended it as a record of the nature and, uh, sorry, a record for future naturalists of the nature that was no longer present in areas of Florida. And so from these, we can start to mine, um, I've mined good data, daily data for Blatchley's Florida. And he took a trip to South America over the span of four months in 1922 to 23. And that has complete coverage for that. And I've been able to narrow down the localities. One of the other finds in the Purdue archives is an unpublished manuscript on the ins insects of Royal Palm Park, what is today uh, it became the nucleus for Everglades National Park, um, at that time run by the Florida Federation of Women's Clubs. Um, and Blatchley compiled a manuscript um, of hundreds of typed pages with accounts of species found in the park. And in addition, yearly reports, which we have partial copies in the Purdue um, Entomology Archives. And just an example of matching these um, notes up with the specimens here, we have a Tenebrionid, where we can match that accession number and that date up with Blatchley's notes to identify where he was at Royal Palm Park collecting um, and the specific habitats from which he collected that beetle. And future directions, um, because I need to look at specimens and gather data from individual specimens, I'm hoping to um, sync this up with our digitization efforts and then more broadly apply these localities um, at which Blanchley was collecting to Blanchley's um, non-insect specimens. If you look on Bionomia, there is at least 25 collections with Blanchley material and a significant percentage is non-insect. And this would also go along with sorting. Um, we have Blanchley's scientific correspondence and I'm hoping to find more information on Blanchley's movement and collecting in that to then further inform other Blanchley projects like a catalog of Blanchley's uh, type specimens that are held in the perk. And just a few acknowledgements and thank you all for your time. Your time, perfect. Sadly, no time for questions, but if you have any, please press.
Mm -hmm. All right. Next up is uh, Tommy McElrath, and he's going to talk about digitization at the INHS and TaxonWorks. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, so, yeah, I'll be talking about a uh, big GBIF update that we did and all the technology we used to get there. So first, I would like to acknowledge the species file group and some of my co-authors, Matt Yoder and Dmitry Dmitriev, uh, as well as a lot of the coders at TaxonWorks, uh, Arnon and Jose especially. So the other species file group people like Debbie Paul and Ed DeWalt have been really helpful in uh, everything that's going on here. And then I'd really like to acknowledge the community of people on TaxonWorks, some of you are here in the room who've really uh, been helpful in discussions and other things that have gone into a lot of this stuff. So first, I'd just like to introduce the uh, INHS Insect Collection. Um, we're, uh, this is a view from above the Natural Resources Building. Uh, there's a pretty beautiful photograph by Chris Grinter when he was here. Um, and we're located in Champaign, Illinois. Uh, it's about two hours south of Chicago. Um, we have about three to four million specimens in our pinned collection, uh, about four to five million specimens in our ethanol collection, and another, uh, yeah, four to five million specimens in our ethanol collection. Um, and then uh, about 150,000 uh, slides uh, you can see there. So uh, we have about right now digitized, we have about uh, 26, uh, 2.6 uh, 2 million specimens, about 100,000 or so collection objects. You can see the relative numbers there. Um, and anything that has a little uh, TaxonWorks logo with a little star was actually generated natively in TaxonWorks. These are reports that are generated just with uh, custom tasks. You don't have to do any coding or anything to get all of these uh, or even put it in an Excel document. Um, so we have a lot of digitized data. Um, uh, you can see here kind of the setup um, of a bunch of different families. There's a lot of data you can see there. We don't really have to talk about it too much. But unfortunately, um, only about uh, as of um, from May 2015 till about uh, May of 2022, only about 656,000 of those were on scan, GBIF, and IDIG bio. Um, so why did it take us so long to get to this many collection objects? Um, what happened in those uh, seven years? So around 2015, we were still using three different databases, um, an access database, uh, a custom SQL database, FileMaker Pro 1, and we had to export all of these with a custom script uh, maintained by Dmitry Dmitriev. We couldn't import any of our images. There were a lot of other legacy issues. Um, and we used this until late 2019. Um, the other problems were that we were still databasing a lot of things during this time. So uh, about, we had a tritrophic interactions grant from NSF that um, uh, databased about uh, 532,000 collection objects, mostly in Miptera, um, where they captured a lot of verbatim data and then parsed that via algorithms. We also, um, had a, a collections in support of biological research grant uh, for a lot of orphan collections that we took on at INHS, including um, some stuff from the Ohio Biological Survey, several smaller uh, um, EPT orders, as well as the BD spider collection uh, from Southern Illinois University. And this added another 100,000 more collection objects. And we were also capturing images of labels and verbatim label data, um, which we could not actually put into our database. Um, we also had uh, a whole bunch of slide collection images, mostly of thrips uh, from uh, back, that were actually generated back in the early 2000s, those actual slide scans um, that all had database numbers, but none of them were in our database because we couldn't handle images. So you're seeing a repeated problem here of we're generating lots of data, but don't actually have the data infrastructure to capture it or, and to share it. And finally, uh, just to go back to earlier in today's session, we were also a uh, receive money to digitize all of our terrestrial parasites as part of the terrestrial parasite tracker. Um, and this has so far added about 70,000 more new specimens, uh, about 35,000 or so collection objects. And we were needing new workflows for all of this. Um, we were coming up with lots of new ways to creatively digitize our specimens. And additionally, 
we were also getting uh, new accessions uh, that had Darwin Ford uh, archives associated with them. So we didn't have to retroactively georeference or import all those in our database, but we couldn't import Darwin Core archives into our current database without custom scripts. I couldn't do that, I'm not a programmer. And we had another 5,000 to 6,000 or so objects that were basically sitting there waiting to come into our collection. So this is all the problems we were facing. And this is why from 2015 until 2022, we weren't uploading anything to any data aggregators. The solution for us was TaxonWorks, which is developed um, at the uh, University of Illinois Species File Group. So here are some of the solutions. We started doing new tasks like loan management, um, a new collection comprehensive specimen digitization task, um, matching and filtering objects, collection objects. Um, and a really cool grid digitizer. Um, uh, other things like importing Darwin Core archives and uh, exporting your Darwin Core archives, all these different tasks were coming up uh, and being developed in Taxon Works for about five years in partnership with myself um, and all the other members of the Species File community group or community. Um, as needs were coming up, we were developing new tasks. Uh, so that people who didn't understand coding uh, could actually do all this stuff with a, a very minimal amount of um, coding and stuff like that. Um, the last bit of custom code that had to be done was a huge custom migration from all of our databases into the TaxonWorks collection management platform. Um, this included uh, almost a million collection objects, half uh, a quarter million collecting events created from custom created from our old locality tables, another 25,000 collection profiles, over 50,000 containers, 12 million data attributes, which are which was data quality assurance migration, basically just copying the old data into custom fields just to make sure all of it got transferred over uh, instead of just being mapped to the TaxonWorks fields. Um, additional uh, loan forms, loan items, taxon names and OTUs. It was a huge custom script, basically done mostly by Dmitry Dmitriev. Um, fantastic uh, migration. Um, and just, I've already mentioned this a little bit, but let's talk about what collection objects are because we don't, we don't always use the term lots and specimens. Collection objects include anything that has a catalog number in your database. So this is both lots and specimens. Um, and so if I talk about specimens, it means the total number of specimens versus uh, a, a single collection object. And that would be everything within a lot. Um, collecting events are the who, the who, when, where, and how, inclusive of localities. Um, so all of these are different collection events. Um, uh, we got Andrew Johnson and Matt Gimmel making a little appearance there, although right now Andrew kind of looks like a yucca. So. Um, so what was one of our first solutions? The first one of these big tasks in Taxon Works was importing Darwin Core archives. So all you do is you drag a Darwin Core archive or a CSV with Darwin Core archive headers, drag it into your uh, your uh, a project in TaxonWorks, and uh, you have to do a little bit of um, just like uh, uh, metadata adding and a few other things, and then you import it, and that was it. Um, so these are all the ones we've imported so far. It's about 5,000 collection objects, everything from um, student loan returns to uh, larger B accessions from the entomology department at UIUC, and about 5,000 collection objects. One of our next solutions was this awesome grid digitizer, with grid digitizer, which to some extent was inspired by Inselect. Um, and so for this, you drag a scanned, a scanned bunch of collection objects or anything that can be divided into grids. Um, so for us, this was a slide, a slide that you use with the basic slide scanner. This has been fantastic for the terrestrial parasite tracker. And then you just add little grids onto there and designate which things become what. So if you have any metadata, you turn it into metadata, you turn the boxes into metadata and you can assign uh, catalog numbers and a bunch of other things. And this will automatically create collection objects for you from a scanned slide tray. Um, just to give you an how, idea of how effective this is, all of those uh, scanned um, slides that we had from back in the 2000s, um, right when the pandemic hit, uh, basically I decided, okay, we're gonna work through those. We'll see how long this takes. To create skeletal collection objects, um, you can see one hourly created 26,000 collection objects over 10 months, most of which was in a span of three months. And that was right when we started, we basically just started plowing through these and creating collection objects. And we were extremely uh, uh, effective and um, productive during those first few months of the pandemic when this was all we were doing. Um, another another uh, task were powerful filters to let you actually find all the things in your collection. 
Uh, so for example, here, I'm searching for uh, types from Illinois on pins of monotomids, which are the best beetles. Um, I found we have two in the NHS collection. That's cool. Um, but what if I actually want to start look like making our collection better? So here I'm going to search for beetles that have depictions but don't have a prep type. So that should be pretty easy for me to figure out if they, these are pinned or a vial or something like that. Um, and that's pretty easy. It came up with uh, 13,000 or 1,300 uh, records or so. And then I can send these to another solution, uh, another task called match collection object, where I then uh, select, uh, select all of them and change the prep type here uh, to vial because I figured out based on those search criteria, I knew that these were all going to be vials. And boom, I updated 1,393 records in less than one minute. Uh, to all be vial type. And so I don't have to go through and do those manually. Finally, we wanted to export all this stuff. So all those tasks beforehand were just managing the data we already had or importing new data. Um, we also finally export. And so we created a task to export drawing for archives for collection objects. Um, and we're able to host this on our private or on the INHS um, website. You can just host it wherever and then direct GBIF to, uh, and the other data aggregators to grab it. Um, and what's cool is that we then used reciprocal illumination for, collect, for collections here um, to go through all the validations from IDIG Bio and GBIF, find all the collection objects using those powerful filters, and um, improve a lot of these problems you find in any data set when you have massive numbers of digitization objects going in. And so the result was a new data set on GBIF, IDIG Bio, and SCAN. Um, we exported all those different platforms. Um, and we're able to massively improve our data set as well as finally get it back up and online for people to use and see. And one of the coolest things that I've found is because we also export natively identified by IDs, these new um, uh, IDs that are now in Darwin Core Corpus, um, we actually get to automatically connect to other tools through things like Wikidata and um, uh, ORCID IDs. So for example, this is on Bionomia. Uh, my profile, or the one on the left is the INHS profile, and on one on the right is my profile in Bionomia. All of the stuff from 2015 onwards, uh, I did not manually claim um, in Bionomia. You know, if you've used this tool, you have to go through and manually claim all specimens that were detected on GBIF. These automatically went into Bionomia because I have my ORCID um, identified uh, in our database, and it automatically gets exported. Um, same thing with older collectors. So you can on the left in INHS um, those. Uh, are all older collectors with uh, Wikidata IDs, and those automatically get uh, harvested by uh, harvested by Bionomia. So, in the future, I would like to see more. Uh, what's next? I'd like to see more exported Darwin Core fields. We're just lacking a few of them. We really need to um, uh, remove the hosting step as well. Um, finally, I'd really like to uh, make this even stronger, better, and faster. We're starting to do leveraging the power of uh, verbatim data and stepwise editors. And I can talk to you more about that if you want to. Um, and with that, I'll take any questions. Yeah. Um, so we do we do export lots. Um, we export them as collection objects. Um, which is basically the same thing as a lot or specimen. So, yes, yeah, all of them get to go to GBIF. Sorry, the question was, uh, do we export our lots to our data aggregators? And yes, we do. Um, if you want to any, hear any more information, uh, one of our collections assistant, Lily Hart, also has a um, poster coming up in the poster session. And you can always ask me questions. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right, last talk before the break. Um, Max Barclay, fighting the long defeat. Thank you very much. Hi, so I'm Max Barclay, and many of you will probably have come across me before. As I'm the collection manager of Coleoptera at the uh, Natural History Museum in London, which most of you will know as the British Museum, which it hasn't been for a long time, but we still <laughs> understand that uh, that's how we generally know. And I'm going to be making a rather philosophical talk, really, a thought experiment, just some things that occurred to me during the course of the kind of work that we do. And the reason I think it's acceptable to do something like that here is because I always think that the Entomological Collections Network 
is very important because it makes me realize that I'm not alone. And one of the things that I think a lot of us in entomological collections feel when we're interacting with people outside of entomological collections is that we can feel very alone or we can feel very isolated or we can feel that what we're doing is a little bit strange. And coming back to an environment like this is very affirming for me and very important. So I titled this as um, Fighting the Long Defeat, Insect Collections in an Age of Increasing Relevance and Decreasing Recognition. So a little bit about what we do first. We have in the entomology uh, section at the Natural History Museum, we have about 24 curatorial staff. We have about 30 associates, volunteers, temporary staff, and we have a lot of visitors coming through and using the collections, including many of you who are here in the audience. Um, the collection is supposed to have, in insects, not in Coleoptera, about 30 million specimens, representing about a million species. Uh, in um, the section, we've got about 300,000 uh, species represented by types. That's about 99,000 in Coleoptera, and we're always wondering who's going to just have the 100,000th type. It's going to be quite soon, I hope. So yeah, we have a lot of material going out on loan, about 2,500 uh, loans going out in an average year and a global collaboration. We have acquisitions of new collections and uh, we're trying to get as much of this as possible available online through digitization. About a thousand new species added to the collections or described from the text as ever. Yeah. Now the title that I used comes from Tolkien from the Lord of the Rings. I haven't seen the new Amazon Prime series, so don't ask me about it because I haven't seen it yet. But there's a theme that runs through Tolkien that much would, that once was is lost because nobody alive now remembers it. And I felt that. I'll explain later why I feel that some aspects of our work are continuing to fight something that is inevitably dwindling. The kingdom of the elves in the Lord of the Rings is a relic of what it once was, and it's sort of protected, but inevitably is going to fade. And that's what I hope is not going to happen with natural history collections. But with the destruction of natural habitats, the urgency to collect and document the natural world seems to be increasing year on year. So the importance and the relevance of natural history collections at the same time must be increasing year on year. There's a quotation from a fellow American of yours, um, uh, Quentin Wheeler, taxonomy is more important today than ever. With the biodiversity crisis, species are disappearing faster than we can name them. And when species are going extinct as fast as they are, it's really a matter of now or never that we can learn about these species. And then he finishes, I think future generations will be appalled with us that it was so easy to explore biodiversity where we came from and we chose not to. And then very controversially, he finishes by saying, because we're doing parlor tricks with DNA at the time when everything was becoming extinct. Now, to his credit, he said this in the 90s, and there was an awful lot of grant money going into sequencing 500 or 600 base pairs of 18S at a time when the same amount of money could have been used to fund an expedition to a country, to a rainforest that no longer exists. So I can really understand what he's saying. What are we doing in collections? I believe as we're building a new fossil record, an archive of the biodiversity of the planet for present and future study that is as comprehensive as we can make it. Not collecting, not investing in collections in today's world to me, it's like standing in a burning art gallery with a camera and not taking any photographs of the paintings. I think the private collections are a very important constituent of this. They're like the streams and the tributaries that feed into the big rivers of institutional collections. And ultimately that all feeds into the sea of human knowledge. So all of these ingredients are very important. A quote that I love by Mike Farrow in and, and, um, 2015, creation, maintenance, and growth of natural history collections. There's a concern that it's nearly always justified in utilitarian or economic reasons. That its uh, collection exists to solve particular problems of the day. But they think that those arguments fail to recognize that discovery and exploration of the natural world is part of the human condition. Like sports, music, and art, it belongs to a class of human activities that they describe as endeavors without end. Another quote from an administrator at the... Uh, an institution that I'm closely associated with, 
He said, providing access to our collections is providing a world-class service to our competitors. To some extent, that's what we're up against. That's an attitude that one would initially describe as ill-advised, but it points to a fundamental problem because it points to a fundamental misunderstanding of the interconnectedness of all of the natural history collections of the world. And thinking that we're running like a university department and if we give our resources to other people, we're actually creating stronger competition for a limited grant pool and so on. Unfortunate that it's come to that. It makes me wonder what our predecessors did. This is Sir Richard Owen, who was the founder of the Natural History Museum. He had to fight his acquisition of the museum through parliament. One politician famously said, does Professor Owen really want to put all the different kinds of beetles on display? Surely such a thing would really confuse and fatigue visitors. <laughs> How would Owen have justified the Natural History Museum in those days? Simple, he would have said it was for the glory of God or for it was the queen or it's for the empire, or it was for the country. He would have made statements like that. And we know now, 150 years later, that those justifications are not valid. Probably Owen suggests, suspected in his own mind that they're not valid, just as we suspect when we say we're keeping the collection to study climate change or to study food security we also suspect that our justifications are not valid. This is a problem for science in general because governments have short terms of office, administrators have short terms of tenure, human lifetimes are not very long, but the knowledge of humanity accrues over many generations. There are lots of examples from the discovery of microbes, radium, Mendelian inheritance, the splitting of the atom, DNA, antibiotic properties of fungus. All of these things started to bear visible fruits years, decades, or even generations after their initial scientific discovery. There is an iterative process by which knowledge is acquired and use is found over generations of continuity. It's intrinsically unsatisfying to a politician who is only going to be in power for four years or an administrator who's only going to be there for 10, the very, very long time over which knowledge is distilled and reaches its fruit. So I like to say that our understanding of our place in nature and why we're here, the whole mechanism of natural selection is partly because a couple of young amateurs like to collect beetles in the middle of the 19th century. And I also hardly need to add that if Darwin and Wallace, who changed the world and changed the path of human society with what they discovered, had wanted to do what they did today, it would have been illegal in most countries. So, I'm going to talk about why I actually gave this talk. We recently acquired a major collection from a large private school near London. This was a collection from a school that included, for example, a whole drawer of this species of butterfly, the large copper, which has been extinct in, in Britain since the middle of the 19th century. And it had extensive collections which had been given to it by former students because it's quite a prestigious school. Our current um, chancellor of the Exchequer is a former student of the school. And there was a lepidopterist called Cocaine, who was a student there, and another lepidopterist called Kettlewell, who was a teacher there. And these people and others accumulated specimens and donated them to the school. And the school has kept this collection as a treasure for several hundred years in total if you count the older specimens, but most of it for 50, 60, 70, 80 years. And now it's decided that it doesn't wanna have this collection anymore, and it's gonna to come to the Natural History Museum. Similarly, we picked up the collection recently of Elphinstone Forest Gilmore, who was born in 1922. Gilmore is very interesting. I'm gonna write a paper about him shortly, but he uh, left his collection in Doncaster Museum in Yorkshire. And this consists of about 30,000 longhorn beetles or cerambices. Gilmore is also famous for being one of the only people to spend time in prison for stealing insect specimens from museum collections. <laughs> he spent three months in prison in 1940s, and then he became the director of Doncaster Museum. <laughs> he subsequently got released from his post at Doncaster Museum for making adult movies in the museum, using the museum's equipment. So he's an interesting character. But his collection is full of types and has never been seen by the scientific community before. And Jeff Martin, who's in the audience and I, went and picked up this collection about three weeks ago and transferred it to the museum. 
My initial response is that this is brilliant, that these fantastic collections are coming to the museum where they're going to be accessible. But then I think children learn in school about habitat destruction, climate change, extinction of species, the insect apocalypse. And here is a school and the local museum who are in the unique position of having inherited remarkable tools to answer interesting questions about these important and relevant phenomena. And their inclination is to get rid of these tools. Of course, concentration of data, either physically or digitally, is objectively good because the information contained within specimens is easy to interpret the larger the data set. And getting materials into places where they're valued and maintained and made accessible and protected from harm is also objectively good. But I think there's a societal risk if schools and local museums are getting rid of their collections. There will be fewer sources of inspiration and fewer role models for a next generation of entomologists. And there's also the entirely practical risk of putting all the eggs in one basket, for example, as the fires at Lisbon or Rio de Janeiro can show us. So to conclude with another even earlier fantasy author, H.G. Wells, in the time machine, he envisages the degeneration of humanity into two polarized species or taxa, which he calls the Eloi and the Morlocks. One of these is vegetarian and peace-loving and agrarian, and the other one is warlike and cannibalistic and industrialized. And the time traveler in the book originally envisages these as uh, characteristics of good and evil. But he later realizes when he finds library museums that have crumbled into dust and disintegrated, that this is not good and evil. These people have just polarized and degenerated into an equivalent of predatory and herbivorous animals. They've lost their humanity because they have lost the fundamental pursuit of knowledge and the need of understanding. And this is a concern for all of us, I think, that society is losing its way and losing its appreciation of the importance of natural history collections and what they can teach us. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions. Right. I'll leave the last words to Isaac Asimov, who wrote over 600 books, and so he had a quotation for almost everything. The reason I don't feel an undiluted triumph about the acquisition and preservation of two important collections is the danger that natural history collections can become small islands of learning and appreciation in a rising school of ignorance and indifference. Like Lorian and the Lord of the Rings, we need to be alert so that we're not just simply fighting the longer feed. All right.